Hi, I'm Professor Mark Rabowski, and this video will give you an overview of media law as it pertains to the Internet. Specifically, we'll discuss the history of Internet law, why the Internet is difficult to regulate, which laws exist, and which legal issues remain. First, some history about Internet law. When it comes to law and order, the Internet may seem like the Wild West. In other words, a new frontier without any law or order. But there are laws, and there have been for at least 15 years. If you go back to 1997, in the case Reno v. American Civil Liberties Union, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously ruled that content on the Internet should be protected by the First Amendment. This was the first major ruling regarding regulation of materials online. So while Internet law does not have the same long-standing Supreme Court precedents as do other areas of law, such as campus speech and newspaper publishing, due to its newness, it's certainly not a free-for-all. But regulating the Internet is not easy. In the past decade, many proposed laws have been ruled unconstitutional for being too broad and too vague. Recent legislation, such as the Child Online Protection Act and Communications Decency Act, both proposed by Congress, sought to ban lewd and annoying material. But what does that mean? What's annoying or disgusting for one person may not be annoying or disgusting to another. Regulating the Internet also raises jurisdictional issues. The Internet, unlike broadcast stations, is worldwide and therefore beyond United States jurisdiction in many cases. In other words, it has no national boundaries. No one country can claim to own cyberspace. So, for example, the United States can't control what's on a Turkish website. All it can do if it doesn't want uh, Americans to view a Turkish website is to block their access to that website. China does this, but would Americans support such censorship? Another dilemma is, who do we punish for illegal activities that occur online? The Internet allows for a lot of anonymous speech. Often, authorities have difficulty tracing the source of controversial material. So, do we go after websites and Internet service providers instead, that is, shoot the messenger? Is it reasonable and practical to hold them responsible for the millions of things posted online every day? Regulation of the Internet has also been hindered by technical difficulties at the Supreme Court. Supreme Court justices lately have displayed a startling level of ignorance about computing and communication methods that many Americans take for granted. Yet as members of the nation's highest court, they're increasingly setting legal precedents about these very technologies. For example, at a November oral argument, Chief Justice John Roberts, who reportedly still drafts his opinions with a pen and paper instead of a keyboard, compared a software program being executed on a computer with a typewriter typing out words on a piece of paper. He also referred to internet search engines as search stations. In an April oral argument, Justice Anthony Kennedy wondered what would happen if a text message were sent to someone at the same time he was communicating with someone else. Does he have a voicemail saying that your call is very important to us, we'll get back to you, Kennedy asked, eliciting laughter from those in attendance. The justice's tech cluelessness was not just an irrelevant oops, but actually incredibly important in the two cases, one applying intellectual property law and the other interpreting the privacy protections of the Fourth Amendment. During a recent congressional subcommittee meeting, Justice Antonin Scalia admitted he didn't know much about the popular social networking service Twitter. He said, I don't even know what it is, but, you know, my wife calls me Mr. Clueless. The lack of tech savvy among Supreme Court justices could prove to be a big problem going forward. That's because technology touches virtually every aspect of our lives, and often is affected by laws. With the Federal Communications Commission now aggressively attempting to regulate the internet, cyberbullying testing the limits of free speech in schools, and bloggers seeking the same rights as journalists, the court will invariably be called upon to make judgments that relate to technology. If the court can't grasp how business inventions have changed since the Industrial Revolution, or how communication methods have changed since Alexander Graham Bell, then they might make decisions that misapply the law due to a misunderstanding of the facts about technology. On the other hand, 
perhaps ignorance is bliss. Some fear that more regulation of the internet by judges and lawmakers could lead to more problems. They believe the more you regulate the internet, the more you empower the government to control it and limit your freedom of speech. Last year, for example, Congress considered legislation that would create a so-called internet kill switch allowing the president to block Americans' access to the internet if a cyber emergency occurred. Critics fear such powers could be abused. While the bill was not passed, it will likely be proposed and considered again in the future. While regulation of the internet is both difficult and controversial, many laws already exist. For example, reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions have been allowed, such as internet filters, which are required by the Children's Internet Protection Act on computers in public libraries and schools. The government's not saying that Americans can't go and visit smutty websites, they're merely saying they don't want students visiting those websites using government computers because they interfere with the educational mission of public schools. Also illegal are the following practices. Spam or spamming, which is the practice of sending large quantities of junk email to uh, strangers who the sender does not know. Phishing and spoofing, which is the practice of using fraudulent emails and copies of legitimate websites to extract passwords, personal information, or financial data from computer users, usually for the purpose of identity theft. And hacking, which is breaking into a computer network. Copyright infringement is also illegal. That's because copyright laws apply to the internet. Downloading or distributing copyrighted works, such as music and movies, for example, can lead to a fine of up to $250,000 or five years in prison per instance. And authorities are getting better and better at catching people all the time. Uh, for example, they will now put fake tracks on file, sh file sharing sites to locate the IP addresses of illegal downloaders. And with an IP address, they're able to locate the user's home address. Now you may be wondering, how is a website like YouTube still in business, given that so many copyrighted videos are uploaded to it without permission? Well, under the notification clause of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998, internet service providers are required to remove material from websites under their control only if notified by the copyright holder of an infringement. That means that YouTube can't be sued for all the music videos and movies posted on their website without the artist's or studio's permission. This policy consequently annoys recording uh, and movie studios and artists because they must hire people to search YouTube and other sites like it every day to find copyright violations. The artists and studios feel that the websites should be responsible for doing the copyright violation scut work, not them. And on the topic of copyright, keep in mind that online photos are protected by copyright. Just because it's easy to copy a photo via a Google Images search does not mean it's legal. Giving credit to the source does not allow you to use it either. Unless the photo is in the public domain, or you purchase rights to use the photo, or you have the owner's permission to use her photo, you cannot use any image you find online. Next, employer and school regulation of the internet is legal. Employers are allowed to monitor employees' internet use, including their emails. Likewise, schools can monitor students' internet use. That's because they own the computers and email servers and usually require users to agree to a terms of service before issuing an account. Some people, however, consider this an invasion of their privacy, but again, legally, it is permissible. In fact, you may also get fired or kicked out of school for what you post online. In April 2007, for example, a college student filed a $75,000 federal lawsuit against her university alleging that she was denied a teaching certificate and education diploma as a result of a picture on her MySpace page labeled quote unquote drunken pirate in which she is shown drinking out of a yellow Mr. Goodbar cup while wearing a pirate hat. The courts ruled against her and in favor of the university. More recently, in 2010, a North Carolina woman was fired from her job at a pizzeria after complaining about customers on a Facebook page. These are just a couple examples. Keep in mind, 
If it's online, it's public information. More and more companies are using the internet to perform checks on potential employees. According to one recent survey, 50% of employers use social networking sites to run searches on job applicants, and 80% of employers use search engines to check on candidates. Some countries, such as Germany, are considering a ban on this practice, but it's currently legal in the United States. So those are some areas of uh, media law that currently exist online. But there's still a lot of gray area in the law. For example, consider online defamation. Now, defamation is publication of a false statement of fact that seriously harms someone's reputation. Defamation requires five elements. First, there must be publication. So you must say or write something that's seen or heard by a lot of people. If something is published online, where the public can easily access it, that would likely be required publication. Second, the published statement must be false. So if a person uh, states something about you that is embarrassing or that you don't want people to know, it's not defamation. It, it could be some other violation like an invasion of privacy, but if it's true, then it's not defamation. For something to be defamation, it has to be a false statement. Third, it must be a statement of fact. So for example, if I go and say, Professor Grabowski's tie was stolen, well, that's something that I could prove is factually incorrect. I could go and show you the receipt and, and demonstrate that I bought it legitimately. However, if you go and say, Professor Grabowski's tie is ugly, well, that's not a statement of fact. That's a statement of opinion. And opinions are not libelous, even if you don't agree with them. And the final element for defamation is that it must involve an identifiable person. So, for example, if you go and say that uh, Professor Grabowski is a drug dealer, well, then you've clearly identified me. However, if you go and say a professor at the university is, not, is a drug dealer, um, you know, Keep in mind, Adelphi has hundreds of professors, so you could be referencing any number one of them. So uh, they couldn't, as a group, go and sue you for libel because no particular individual has been identified. On the other hand, keep in mind that you don't have to specifically name someone to libel them. So for example, if you say there is a, a young journalism professor at Adelphi University who's selling drugs, well, I'm the only person who would fit that description. So I could potentially go and, and sue you for libel. Fourth, it must cause serious harm. So for example, if you go and say uh, Professor Grabowski uh, is, is dealing drugs, that is something that could seriously harm my reputation and, and I could get you know fired for or investigated by the police. On the other hand, if you say I saw Professor Grabowski help an elderly woman across the street, even if that's false, that's not something that's going to seriously harm my reputation. Even if you say something like, I saw Professor Grabowski give a dirty look to a student, even if that's untrue, likewise, that's not something that's going to seriously harm my reputation. So keep in mind, in order for something to be libelous or be considered defamation, you must have all five of these elements. If you're missing even one of these elements, it doesn't meet the requirements for defamation and the uh, person trying to sue wouldn't have a case. So as with copyright law, uh, defamation law, and libel law also apply to the internet. Uh, but it's a little bit different with the internet. Uh, let me explain. If a newspaper publishes a libelous comment, even if they were just quoting someone else, even if the reporter didn't make the libelous statement, he was merely quoting a source, <clears throat> the newspaper could still conceivably be sued for libel. But the law is a bit different for websites. The website might not necessarily be sued if it uh, has a, a libelous comment on its website that was made by someone else. In cases of libelous statements on the internet, the degree of liability for defamation uh, depends on the degree to which the internet service provider exercises editorial control over the comments made. Uh, so someone defamed on Twitter or Facebook could likely sue the person who made the libelous comment, but they probably couldn't sue those websites. 
Now there have been cases where websites have been found liable for statements that uh, users posted on their website. As I said, it all depends on the um, amount of uh, editorial control and monitoring uh, that webmasters do. Um, ironically, uh, court rulings seem to reward negligent webmasters. Uh, a website is more likely to be liable for defamation if uh, they take additional steps contr to control the content of discussion groups or comments on their website uh, because that makes them a publisher of information. On the other hand, if a website does not attempt to monitor and control comments or moderate discussion groups, uh, they can argue that they're merely a distributor of information. Consequently, many attorneys advise their clients to avoid censoring such discussion groups and comments for fear of defamation liability. Such a hands-off approach can only increase the likelihood that defamatory statements will be made in the future. So what that means is if you're operating a website like Juicy Campus or one of these online burn books where people go and post uh, defamatory information about other people, you're better off not responding to complaints and not removing content uh, that, that people complain about and just sort of ignoring any complaints you receive and, and, and not tampering with the website whatsoever. At least you're better off in terms of legal liability. Another troublesome area of law is what's known as SLAP suits. SLAP is an acronym for Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation. Uh, it's basically a libel or defamation lawsuit that is filed to uh, censor and silence critics. It's, it's not really filed because the uh, plaintiff thinks they have a legitimate uh, case uh, of defamation. Um, basically, the plaintiff does not expect to win, uh, but instead files the lawsuit as a means to intimidate the defendant and in some cases <clears throat> that a plaintiff may not even file a lawsuit but merely have his lawyer threaten to sue. Rather than deal with the time and expense of a lawsuit, many defendants will simply abandon their opposition or criticism. A slap suit may also deter others from participating in the debate or criticism. Here's an example. After a particularly painful visit to her dentist, a woman decided to vent on Yelp.com which is a popular consumer rating website. She described her experience on the website in excruciating detail. She wrote, don't go there unless you like mouth torture. Her dentist, in turn, sued her, claiming that the review caused the dentist to drop in revenue. But thanks to a newly passed anti-slap law in California, a judge dismissed the case and ordered the dentist to pay $43,000 in legal fees to the patient. But now the patient is reluctant to post reviews on Yelp, of course. Perhaps the trickiest area of internet law these days is cyberbullying. Cyberbullying, as you probably know, is the use of email, instant messaging, chat rooms, pagers, cell phones, or other forms of information technology to deliberately ha harass, threaten, or intimidate someone. Following recent student suicides that were linked to cyberbullying, including one at a Long Island high school, several states have passed or are considering le legislation that would criminalize cyberbullying. Such laws, however, raise First Amendment issues. That's because cyberbullying is often limited to online insults about someone's physical appearance, their friends, their clothing, or their sexuality. Things like, Sam is a slut, Jamal is fat, or Ricky is ugly. While statements like that are mean, they're not libelous or an invasion of privacy. They're simply opinions and protected by the First Amendment, and that includes mean opinions. But some forms of cyberbullying are clearly illegal and not protected by the First Amendment. If a statement is threatening, such as, I'm going to kill you, or if a statement is libelous or defamatory, which means it's provably false and seriously damages someone's reputation, or if a statement is an invasion of privacy, that is, if it's a private fact, like a medical condition that the individual hasn't revealed to anyone, then it's illegal, and we already have laws to deal with that. Additionally, private schools can punish cyberbullies because they're not governed by the First Amendment, 
Remember, the First Amendment only applies to the government, which includes public schools and universities. Cyberbullying laws are the source of great debate in this country. Some people feel that cyberbullying is such a big problem that the government should intervene and do something about it. But others oppose cyberbullying laws because they believe you can't legislate norms. You can only teach norms. And just because there's a law, people don't necessarily follow it. For example, look at using cell phones while driving. Most people seem to do it, especially teenagers. The law in itself does not render citizens virtuous. Another big topic of debate is network neutrality. Network neutrality is a principle that advocates no restrictions on content, websites, platforms, etc. related to the internet. Internet service providers such as Roadrunner, Optimum Online, Verizon, Adelphi University, etc. could conceivably control the pipeline so that certain websites may load slower than other websites or be blocked altogether. They could also require websites to pay fees to ensure that their websites load quickly for their visitors. This is a major issue and will likely be the subject of legislation and lawsuits in years to come. Now let's talk about linking. For the most part, there are no restrictions on linking your website to any other website you want to. For example, you could have a link to adelphi.edu or ESPN.com on your blog or personal homepage and you don't need the other website's permission. Some countries, however, such as Australia, forbid linking to copyrighted material. However, things like hot linking or inline linking, that is, embedding videos and photos from other websites, and things like framing, which is making one website appear as if it's part of the linking website, have been and will likely continue to be the subject of court battles for years to come. Of course, if a website permits its users to embed its content, as YouTube does with its videos, there wouldn't be any legal issues with that. Finally, another issue courts and lawmakers will be grappling with in coming years is whether bloggers should have the same rights as journalists. Courts, government officials, and others have been reluctant to afford the same rights and protections to bloggers. After all, anyone with a computer can call himself a blogger and giving protections and privileges to reckless, untrained hacks could encourage abuses that make it difficult for real journalists. But this could change going forward as the popularity of the traditional mainstream media declines and startup websites and blogs increasingly become sources of news for the public. Well, that concludes today's presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to contact the email address listed on the screen. Remember two things about internet law. First of all, internet law, although it's fairly new, is a vast area of law. Secondly, internet law is in a state of flux. It's constantly changing. So I encourage you to go beyond this video and keep up on developments in the area of internet law.